Welcome to Monday's edition of Renew Plus. I'm Pastor Tony. Thank you for joining us for another week. In fact, this is the 12th and final week of our series, A New Paradigm. We've been talking in this whole series about mind renewal. And of course, and we're talking about mind renewal as we've already established. We're not just talking about surface thoughts. We're not just talking about adding intellectual facts and knowledge and mindless data entry on top of that old way of thinking. No, really mind renewal according to the Word of God, according to the New Testament, means that we completely renovate our old mindset. We get down to the very roots, the very framework of the way we think, not just the individual independent thoughts, but the way we're thinking, what's producing those thoughts, and our perspective, how we see things, how we view things, how we, how we interpret life, how we respond to life. All those things are included in mind renewal. And of course, that takes the Word of God and the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you in order to accomplish that. But we've given you some basics, some working knowledge on how to go about doing this. And you know, as we begin to practice what we've talked about, uh, you know, the previous 11 weeks and this week as well, then uh, you'll, you'll be able to renew your mind and line your thinking up with new covenant, new creation living and realities. And of course, that is the truth. That is, that is the way God sees you and the way God sees things. And of course, we want to see things the way He does. That is mind renewal. We begin to think His thoughts and see through His eyes, basically, then we can do that. And the only way you can do that, again, is through the Word and the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to go back over and start this week in some verses of Scripture. We looked at, I believe, last week, maybe the last week or two, over in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua, the first chapter. And of course, this would apply to us as well. You know, this principle has not really changed. We've just been able to expand it and include this in the New Covenant. Uh, Joshua and the children of Israel, at the time uh, that this was written, did not uh, have that, but they had a promised land. They had a covenant with God and they had a promised land that God wanted them to possess, that He had given them to possess. But in order to do that, they were going to have to change their old way of thinking. And that is very true about us as well. If you want to possess the promised land that God has for you personally, individually, uh, then you're going to have to re renew your mind and think differently. You're not going to be able to go in and possess your promised land that God's set in front of you, that God's given you with an old man's mindset. And of course, the previous generation were trying to do that and they failed miserably. They could not enter in because of unbelief, because they never, they just refused to change their mindset. Even though God had basically spoon fed them and shown them and demonstrated to them what he wanted to do in their life, they just never allowed God in their thought life. It, it was always centered around them, what they could do. And of course, that has limitations. That has s short ceilings and, and small fence lines. And, and we don't want to do that. God wants to break those down, take us out to what He can do. And of course, when we're talking about mind renewal, we're talking about putting God at the center of our thought life, including God in every thought, in every perspective in our whole life. We're not just talking about compartmentalizing God and putting Him over in kind of a side corner over there, you know, bring Him out every once in a while, you know, while we think about religion or while we think about Christmas or Easter or some kind of occasion like that or even on Sunday morning. God needs to be included in our thought life and in our heart belief system every day of our life, 24-7, every day of the year. So here in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, God is instructing Joshua and the children of Israel. I don't believe these instructions were just simply for Joshua. He was the leader of the children of Israel, but it was supposed to be for all of them. They were all going to have to do this, but this was on, at the onset of them, this next generation, going in and possessing their promised land. It was going to require God and God thoughts in order to do that, higher thoughts than they had previously. So verse number eight, now notice verse number eight. This is really good instructions for us as far as renewing our minds and how to go about doing that. Uh, verse eight, it says this book of the law, and we established the last couple of weeks that he, actually they had the first five books of the Bible at that, at that particular time. And that's what he, he was referring to, not just the 10 commandments or the ceremonial law, but 
the whole f five books of the Bible, which would include the Abrahamic covenant and all the other things that pertain to that. So that was a covenant book. So we could say it this way. We have all 66 books of the Bible, and primarily we live in the New Covenant, the New Testament. That doesn't mean we ignore the Old Testament. There is so much good material, so many good things that we can understand and glean revelation from in the Old Testament. But we primarily live in the New Testament, so we want to have our minds specifically renewed to the New Testament, to the New Covenant writings. So we can say it this way, this word of God shall not depart from your mouth. I pointed out last week, as Jesus said, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you allow the word of God to depart from your mouth, in other words, it's not involved in your speech anymore, in your talking. I'm talking about your everyday talking, not your ju just your uh, religious talking or your Sunday morning talking at church. I'm talking about your everyday talking. If the Word of God is not coming out of your mouth, then that there's two things involved. First of all, you're not putting the Word of God in. It's not in your meditation time. It's not in your thought life, your active thought life. Second of all, if it's not in your heart in abundance, it's not going to be coming out of your mouth either. So departing from your mouth, that means it, when, when the Word of God is in our mouth, then that means it's going to be in our mind. And when it's in our mind and in our heart, it's going to come out of your mouth. You're going to speak and you're going to talk about things that are in abundance in your own heart and in your own mind, in your thought life. Now notice he says, do not let it depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Now meditation is more than just reading the Bible, not just having a Bible in front of you day and night 24-7. Of course, reading is involved in it, uh, in our stance, but meditation goes beyond just reading the Bible or quoting it or memorizing it meditation then goes to putting yourself in that picture it's actually when you're meditating you know when you think about anything you're not just thinking about words on a page you're not just you know when you think about your dog you're not just thinking about the letters D-O-G uh, or your cat C-A-T or something like that or your house you know H-O-U-S-E you know, you're not just thinking about those words and those letters. You're actually thinking about the picture. Words paint pictures. Words contain images, as we've already pointed out. So when we're meditating the Word, we're actually allowing the Word of God to paint that picture on the inside of us. The same picture that's in the heart and the mind of God is transferred and transmitted to us and our heart and mind when we begin to take the Word of God and meditate on it. And of course, that involves you taking that personally, you seeing yourself in what the Word says, you seeing yourself with it, doing it, and having it. And that is such an important part of meditation. You can do this all the time. You can be involved in other things, but still have the Word of God in your mind and in your heart, still meditating on the Word of God. Yes, I can be thinking about something in the natural realm, but I never really get away from allowing the Word of God to uh, govern my thought life and govern what's in my heart and my heart meditations and at night I tell you that is an important part and you know so many times I found out that I can sleep better when I put the Word of God in my mind and in my heart when I'm meditating the Word as I go to sleep see if everything else is on my mind worry anxiety that's going to keep you awake but if you want sweet sleep I can tell you, you start meditating the Word you'll go right off to sleep if you wake up in the middle of the night you can't go back to sleep, just put the Word of God uh, in your ear or just meditating in the Word of God and you'll find out you'll, you'll relax and you'll go back to sleep. When you get up in the morning, first thoughts should be about God and about His Word, not, not allowing the, the enemy to have his way and start pounding you from the time you open your eyes in the morning. That's not getting your, your day off to a good start. So night and day is all the time, isn't it? And of course, that meditation needs to be going on all the time. And you know, that meditation means that the Word of God is governing my thoughts, the way I think, the way I perceive things, the way I respond and react to life. So in other words, every thought that comes in my mind, everything that I view externally, it should be screened out and viewed in accordance with and interpreted by the Word of God. And see, that's, that, that is part of our Word meditation day and night. Now, notice it goes on to say that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Now, observing means that you are 
you, you are seeing yourself doing that. So as you're meditating on the Word, you're actually seeing yourself doing what the Word says. Now I'm going to get to this a little later in this week because that's an important part. But notice it goes on to say, for then. See, after you do those things, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Now God's all about you being prosperous and having good success in life. Don't let religion and religious tradition tell you otherwise or somebody else, somebody else's opinion. God's, God's word, wants God wants you to prosper and be a good success in life. But in order to do that, you're going to have to think God's thoughts. Now when you're meditating in the word day and night, you have it in your mouth and in your mind and in your heart and you're seeing yourself doing that, having that, and, and receiving what the Word says in your life, you see yourself in that picture, then what you're doing is actually seeing yourself according to the way God sees you. This is Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. It says, As the snow and the rain come down out of heaven and water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, goes on to say, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it will prosper in the thing for which I sent it will uh, it will accomplish what I please and it will prosper in the thing for which I sent it so in other words God has given us his higher thoughts and his higher ways contained in his word they come down out of heaven as the snow and the rain and they water the soil of our heart and notice it contains the Word of God as a container contains everything necessary for us to be prosperous and successful in life so as we meditate the Word, as we see ourselves in it, doing it, having it, then guess what? Then we will make our way prosperous and we'll have good success. We'll make right decisions. We'll, we'll do the right things. We'll not make the, uh, have the mistakes and failures of the past because the Word will train you different. And see, that's really what uh, renewing our mind is, is training our minds and tra training our hearts to think and to see like God thinks and sees according to His Word. Now, with that in mind, look, look back real quick to verse number, um, verse number two and three. We, I think we read this last week as well, previously in Joshua 1. Verse 2, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Now God had given them that land already. It was just as much for the previous generation as for this one. But they just didn't cooperate with God. They didn't walk with Him, and they didn't renew their minds. They, they would not allow their minds to be renewed. In fact, when it came time to go in, they said, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers in our own sight. Well, that's not the way God saw them. God saw them as more than conquerors. He saw them as overcomers. He knew what was in that land. He knew the giants in the wall cities, but God never intended for them to go in by their own strength and power and overcome all those things. He intended for them to go in in the power of His might, of God's might, being strong in Him and going in there and possessing that land. God said, I'm going to go before you. But they failed to go in. So notice that God's, uh, God's instructing them. He said, Moses, my servant, he's dead and gone. He said, I'm still here. All right, Joshua, children of Israel, I'm still here. I'm the one that you really need to be focused on. So he said, arise, go into this land which I've given to them. And verse 3 says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread will tread upon I have given you as I said to Moses I actually said this to Abraham as well as we're gonna look at but notice he said every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given to you in other words everywhere where they could walk they were gonna have it. it it belonged to them they were gonna possess that land but they had to go in with a God mindset with God at the focus and the center of their thought life they couldn't go in with an old old man's mindset, seeing themselves as grasshoppers, losers, no good, all those other things. They had to see themselves the way God see, sees them. And of course, the way God sees you is the way He said in His Word. And, and God made the difference in our life. We were all losers before God. We were all defeated folks. We were all under the dominion of the spirits of darkness. But listen, God changed all that in the new birth you are not the same person you used to be you're not that old sinner boy you're not that old sinner person that you used to be you're not that old weak person you used to be god has made you strong in him and in the power of his might 
But you've got to see yourself that way. You've got to think his thoughts, his higher thoughts, and adopt his higher ways of seeing and doing things if you want to enter in and possess your promised land. Now I want to introduce this, just the last couple of minutes of our time today, and then we're going to go through this this week. Like I said a minute ago, this is really God's covenant people going in and possessing a promised land that God had previously uh, spoken to and promised Abraham, their father, according to the faith, had promised them in the in, in the covenant he had with them uh, this was hundreds of years before that so uh, let's go back to the book of Genesis real quick I just have time just to introduce this real quickly we're gonna see that these same instructions that God gave to Joshua here in Joshua 1 and the children of Israel and going into possessing this promised land were basically the same instructions that God gave to Abraham previously when he made covenant with him. And if you recall, uh, we've, we've looked at this other, uh, you know, in other series and other, other lessons, that in Genesis chapter 12 is recorded of God, uh, recording of God's cutting the covenant with Abraham. And of course, the covenant means that, that the two lives were intermingled and became as one. A yeah, covenant, the closest we have thing, a thing that we have to a covenant is a contractual agreement. You know, you buy a house, buy a car, do something else, you sign uh, a, a contractual agreement, okay, and you sign your name at the bottom. You agree to do certain things, they agreed to do certain things, it's on paper legally. But a covenant takes that a step further. It's not just uh, a short-term temporary agreement where you enter into a relationship legally with somebody. No, this, uh, this covenant agreement that we're talking about, this is a blood covenant. This is where two lives are mingled together and become as one. In other words, not temporary. Man, this is forever. And, and it's not just, just specific things. Man, I tell you, it just involves every area and every part of their life. And so we, we need to see that and understand that going into this, that when God cut covenant with Abraham, when he had made promises to him, that this was supposed to be passed down to Abraham, to Abraham's seed. And, and then, uh, of course, the promises God made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they were supposed to come to pass for all of Abraham's seed. They were all included in that. And it's because God gave those promises to him. And so in Genesis chapter 12, we're not going to take time to read it, but God cut that covenant with Abraham and he promised to bless him. Now the blessing here in Genesis chapter 12 is an overall covering blessing. It was supposed to cover every part of Abraham's life and every part of Abraham's seed's life. Spirit, soul, body, financially. This is how God got the Messiah into the earth. God, uh, Jesus came in through this Abrahamic covenant. And these promises were to, to cause Abraham to prosper in every area and every part of his life. And so that, that blessing was pronounced upon Abraham. All he had to do conditionally was to believe it. Believe it by faith, take it at, at God's word, and then act on that. And uh, God made some other statements to Abraham regarding that. And we'll look at those as we go through. But we're going to see how Abraham took that covenant promise of the blessing and he began to walk in it and it began he, he became proficient at it in some areas there's one area he struggled in we're gonna see how he overcame that because we all have those things in our life those areas in our life where you know some things man we got it working the other things it just seems like we're struggling with we're gonna see how Abraham overcame that and how we can do the same thing so join us as we go through this week out of time today. If you'd like additional materials and resources, you can always visit us on the web, TonyCowan.org, and we will see you tomorrow.